Come on, put your hands together for Jesus. He's a good God. Well, most of y'all know the question I've been asking. Who do you think you are? Now, I hadn't been asking that in a derogatory way. I've been asking it in a positive way. To make each of us think about who we are in Christ. Because what we think about ourselves, our thoughts determine our future and our destiny. The Bible says that it talks about the thoughts. As a man or as a person thinks, so they are. So really, we need to be able to make sure that we're always thinking God's thoughts. The Bible tells us God's thoughts are higher than our thoughts. His ways are higher than our ways. And it's a daily discipline to be able to start seeing yourself and identifying with God and with all he has for us. You know, we talked about things that actually limit us and limit our identity and make us start seeing ourselves in a negative way to where we feel inferior, where we allow oppression to come upon us and, and just, you know, press us down. And what we need to be able to understand, the first thing we talked about was the past. Everybody say the past. And the best thing you could do with the past is leave it in the past. Paul said, forgetting about those things that lay behind. You see, we're a new creation in Christ. All old things have passed away. Behold, the new has come. That's a new creation reality or identity all of us need to understand. And we talked about when you pass from death to life in Christ through salvation, it's a metamorphosis that takes place. It's just like a tadpole turning into a butterfly. Up. It's just like a, a, a tadpole turning into a frog. Y'all didn't get that, did you? I just wanted to see if you were listening. It's like a, it's like a, a, a moth going into a cocoon and turning into a caterpillar, turning into a, a butterfly. And, and really, what I want you to, to realize, so many people allow their past to dictate their future. They wear a big tattoo on their forehead of their past. And their, their past actually tattoos their future and limits them to where they see themselves not as God sees them, not in the identity that God has for them, the Bible says that we're fearfully and wonderfully made. But that tattoo of our past limits us and causes us to be inferior and causes us to see ourselves in a distorted way. And we need to be able to understand the past needs to be left in the past. The next thing we said that, that limits us and causes us to see the wrong, our wrong identity is fears. Somebody say fears. You know, fears, 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 fear not. The Bible tells us fear not. The Bible tells us to have faith in God. We need to see when we put our faith in God, we're not going to be disappointed. And faith actually empowers us to be able to receive all that God has for us. But fear is the opposite of faith. Paul, being mentored in a protege, uh, his mentor and uh, his, his protege was Timothy. He was mentoring him, and he said, Timothy, God has not given you the spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. You see, we need to be able to understand that we don't have a spirit of fear in Christ. We need to identify with a spirit of faith. We need to be able to identify that we have a spirit of power, love, and a sound mind. Everybody say, I have a spirit of power. Wait, wait, that means everybody. You ready? I have a spirit of power, love, and a sound mind. So, you see, we can't allow our past tattoos. In fact, uh, on Wednesday night, we opened up a free tattoo removal service. We have a praise and prayer time where you can actually come in and let the Holy Spirit take that old bad tattoo off of you of your past so you don't have to see yourself like that anymore. You know, some tattoos are beautiful, but I tell you some, I tell you what, you just want to get rid of. Amen? Now, also... Our past, our fears, our family and friends, people that we work with, they actually mark our lives also and cause us to have the wrong identities. And it's a matter of whose reports you're going to believe. Are you going to believe the report of the Lord 
or are you going to believe the noise that you hear? Now, this principle I'm going to teach today because the, the fourth thing that really causes our identity to be limited and negative is our hearts. Everybody say our hearts. See, when our hearts become hard and calloused, Within relationships, with our relationship to God, with our relationship with our spouse, with our relationship with our children, when our hearts become hard and callous, it causes us to have the wrong identity. Now, open your Bibles with me to Isaiah 54. You're welcome to sit right there, wherever you like, man. It's good to have you. We had a reserve sign there. We've got to take that off. Listen what it says here. The prophet Isaiah here gives us some dynamics to be able to build and deepen our identity in Christ. To be able to, 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 to guard our hearts, you see, from our hearts for the issues of life. Are you with me? Remember what I told you? When I put my hand there, what do you do? Amen? Let's see if y'all know. All right, all right. You see, the Bible says guard your heart, from it flows the issues of life. And really, without the issues of life flowing from you, what happens is, is that things become distorted, especially our identity of ourselves, our identities of those we love, our identity of God. And we start to become very critical of ourselves, our critical of our relationship with God, critical of our relationship with our spouse and our children. Now, Isaiah tells us this in Isaiah 54, 1 and 2. Sing, O barren. You see, when someone is barren, they're lacking in something. They're unfruitful. And really, if our hearts are hard and calloused, our identity of ourselves and others are going to be distorted. So Isaiah says, sing. Now, what I want you to understand is singing is a very important discipline that all Christians need to understand. You see, God wants us to make a joyful noise. The Bible says he's given us the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. And here, Isaiah says, sing, O barren. So if you feel like your heart's hard and callous and it's causing you to become critical toward God and toward yourself and toward others, and you have the wrong perception and identity of yourself, you're seeing things wrong, what you need to be able to do You're lacking. You're lacking the life of God within you. And he says, sing. Everybody say, sing. Now, singing is a very important part of Christianity. I don't know if you realize this, but uh, first-time guest, I guess, that that never been to church like this, you know, we we actually, we allow one-third of our morning worship service to singing. Don't look at me like that in church. It's true. We allow 30 minutes, 30 to 35 minutes to singing. Now, why is that important? Because singing is very important to us in our relationship with God and the way we see ourselves. We put the words of the songs up on the screen, yet they have people that come in, and they've been here for for years, and they'll do this. Some people are singing, you know, they're getting... Praise. Now, why is singing important? Singing is important because the songs that we make have to be louder than the songs we hear. That's why God designed you to sing, to make a joyful noise. You know, it's amazing. My little granddaughter, I tell you, she's, she's, only, she's only 10 months, and, you know, she's beautiful to me. I tell you, I don't know what anybody else thinks about her. But I tell you what, you know, I wanted to make sure she had the right identity. I wanted her to see me, you know, in the right identity. I had to establish an identity with her as a grandparent. So I started singing with her. I started singing, you know, clap ye hands, all ye people, shout to the Lord with a voice of triumph. Clap ye hands, all ye people, shout to the Lord with a voice of praise. Praise him, praise. And you know what? It was amazing to see Amelia because she started smiling. Now, she can't articulate words, but now let me tell you, she sings with me all kind of noises. Ah, ah, ah. But I tell you what she's meant, and she claps her hands. Why is that? 
Because singing develops an identity. Singing the high praises of God develops an identity and causes you to see yourself not lacking in your relationships with God and others. Not lacking in your relationship with yourself. And it's so important to understand that singing is vital to us. Now put up Isaiah 54, 1 and 2. Let me read it through. So you see it. Sing, O barren. So when we're lacking and we start to become critical, you know, critical at the church, critical at the pastor, critical at your spouse, critical at your job. The Bible says, sing, you who have not born, break forth into singing and cry aloud, you who have not labored with child. Enlarge the place of your tent. So here, God's saying, look, what I want you to understand, it's your position to be able to enlarge your heart toward me. And singing does that. You see, singing actually allows us to be able to enlarge our hearts toward God, toward the things of God. And what we need to be able to realize, now listen, church, it's very important that we see that. It's your responsibility as an individual to make sure that your heart is not hard and calloused in your relationship with God. It's your responsibility to make sure your, your heart is not hard and calloused toward your spouse, toward your children. And really, it happens. It just happens nat natural. The, the flesh, the human heart is intently wicked. God created Adam and Eve, and then eight to ten generations later, the Bible says that the world's hearts became intently wicked. God was sorry he made man. He raised up Noah. So you see, it's our responsibility as individuals to make sure that we keep our hearts where life is flowing from them, where God's love is flowing from them, from our hearts, toward God, toward our spouses, toward our children, toward our pastor. Ever say love you, pastor? I like hearing that. Now what I want you to realize is this. You see, singing, put up principle one. Singing neutralizes and dispels the negative noises that we're hearing. If your hearts become hard and callous in your relationship with God, the Bible tells us very clearly to be able to sing when we feel like we're lacking life in our relationship with God. And how do we do that? We do that by enlarging our hearts. Now, it's amazing because clinical studies have, have proven that singing helps reduce stress and anxiety. There's more than one way to deal with stress and anxiety. And the Bible says that, that we need to be able to sing. Why? Because clinical studies have proven that singing helps reduce stress and anxiety and actually releases certain endorphins within our brain that promote and strengthen emotional development. And we need to be able to sing. If God said, if our creator said sing, we need to sing. It doesn't matter how, it's a joyful noise. Come on, somebody. Make a joyful noise, not a skillful noise. And I tell you, you know, when I get along with God, I make a joyful noise. It's amazing to see. You see, because praise has power in it. When we praise God, it releases his power into our lives. It causes us to start seeing things as God sees them. That's why we sing songs around here that have biblical reference to them. They're taken from the scriptures. Why? Because we're singing the scripture and the word actually has a transforming power that causes us to see ourselves and to see God in the way he designed us to see him. Are you with me? Look what it says here in Psalms 139, 14. The psalmist says, David says, I will praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Now listen, put up principle two because I want you to get this. This is on your notes and your, and your news and notes. Look what it says here. The sounds that we make are more important than the sounds that we're hearing. Let me tell you, if you're hearing sounds with inside your emotions in your mind that say, once an alcoholic, always an alcoholic, you need to be able to make some sounds that drown those sounds out. Once a failure, always a failure. 
Let me tell you, those sounds need to be drowned out. You see, those sounds of regret, those sounds, you know, I made mistakes, and you tattoo your past with them. You know, we need to be able to make sure that we're singing a song to God that drowns out and neutralizes those negative thoughts in our mind. Get it? You know, it's so important to be able to realize that Paul talks about it to the Corinthian church. He says, casting down lofty thoughts, high thoughts, thoughts that raise themselves up against the knowledge of God, thoughts that oppress you, thoughts that make you, make you feel oppressed and down. Thoughts that make you feel inferior. Thoughts that make you feel, you know, lower than you should be. You know, we've been created in God's image. And we need to be able to sing about it. It's so relevant. So now I want to challenge you to be able to sing. Everybody say sing. 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 Sing renews your, singing renews your heart. Renews your mind. Now let's go on. Are y'all getting this today? I said, are y'all getting this today? Okay, all right. You see, singing to God releases his presence, his life, and his hope. And that's really what we're doing when we sing. Look at what it says here in Psalms 101, verse 1. David says, I will sing of the mercy and justice. To you, O Lord, I will sing praises. You know, no matter how hard or difficult the situation seems that you're going through, or the circumstances are that you're facing. God could put a new song in your heart to be able to dispel them. To be able, you know, God is light, the Bible says, and in his light, he drives out all darkness, all those negative thoughts, all those high thoughts, all those thoughts that belittle us. Look what it says here in Acts 16, 22 and 26. Paul and Silas could have took on the wrong identity. They're preaching the gospel they're on one of their missionary journeys, and they're preaching, and listen what happens. It says in verse 22, Then the multitude rose up together against Paul and Silas, and the magistrates tore off their clothes and commanded them to be beaten with rods. Let me tell you, this was some rough circumstances. If you ever got beat like that, you, your identity is going to be challenged. And when they had laid many stripes, not only did they beat them, but they actually put stripes on their back. They threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to keep them securely. So here they're beaten up pretty bad with stripes on the back, locked in prison for preaching the gospel. Having received such a charge, he put them into the inner prison. So he didn't put them in, he put them way down into the dungeon. This was a bad place that they were in. And it says here, and fastened, not only did they put them in a the cell in the dungeon, but they fastened their feet in stocks. Now I want you to think about this. Everybody say, but. But at midnight, Paul and Silas was praying and singing hymns to God. And the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately all the doors were open and everyone's chains were loosed. Let me tell you, a song in your heart will shatter the false identity that comes with a hard, calloused heart. You know, it's amazing to be able to see the Bible tells us to guard our heart. From it flows the issues of life. And when you have a hard, calloused heart, you're going to see God in a different way. You're going to be critical. It's human nature to be critical. You'll see your spouse in a different way. You'll be critical toward your spouse and toward your children. Now, don't look at me like that in church. Everybody say amen. Because, you see, it's our responsibility to guard our hearts. Me and my wife, we've been married 32 years, and we've never fallen out of love. We've always loved each other. We're committed to each other. We don't believe in divorce. Sometimes she tells me she does believe in murder, though. <laughs> you got to watch your back, y'all, sometimes. <laughs> but anyway, what happens is in a relationship especially to those that you love and you're close to. Your heart can become hard and callous toward them because we still have insecurities inside of us, even when you're married over 30 years. 
And, and you can become hard-hearted. Maybe they're not doing something right. Maybe they said something wrong, you know, and all of a sudden your heart's hard, it's callous, and, and the issues of life, the love of God is not flowing out of your heart toward that person. Well, when that happens, you know, Isaiah says that we become barren. We're lacking in our, our, our marriage relationship's not supposed to be that way. Are you with me? You're supposed to have life flowing out of your heart toward your spouse. You see, a relationship with Jesus Christ isn't supposed to be that way. When your heart's hard and callous, it becomes a religion instead of a relationship. It becomes a duty and a responsibility instead of a joy to be in his presence. And what Isaiah is saying, he said, sing, O barren, when you become that way. And all of us have those seasons. We have those seasons when we go through it, Chris, where our heart starts becoming callous in our relationship to Jesus. And what we need to be able to understand, God doesn't want to see, he doesn't want us to have that identity. He doesn't want us to be critical to God. He doesn't want us to be critical to our spouses and our children. He doesn't want us to be critical to those that we love and love us. So he says, sing, sing. And as we praise the Lord, something happens within our hearts. There's a transformation. There's a transformation. Say it again, transformation. You know, when I grow up and, I, I, and I'm, I'm 55, I know I don't look that old, but I am. I want to be just like Jim and Amelia Shesby. I, I, want, I want my identity to be just like them. Let me tell you what they do. I'll tell you, they, they're a blessing. Jim still rides a motorcycle every once in a while. His, all his kids and his family ride motorcycles. So they decided to go on a family out. Now, Amelia has a little trouble with her hip. So they decided, you know what? We're not going to put Amelia back on, uh, on the back of Jim's bike. But he still identifies with being strong and young. He says, we're going to get us a convertible Mustang. And we're going to put the top down, and we're going to follow those guys in those bikes. Now, I tell you what, that's the right identity to have, wouldn't you say? That's awesome. You see, they see themselves not as not being able to do things and enjoy life, not being able to do things and enjoy their family. They see themselves as enjoying life. They don't see themselves where they can't do things. They see themselves where they can do things. Now, who do you think you are? I tell you who Jim thinks he is and Amelia thinks she is. But who do you think you are? What kind of identity do you have? Is your past or family or friends or fears giving you the wrong identity? Is your heart calloused and hard toward God? And, and you know, it's even a struggle now to come to church on Sunday. It's amazing to see. Because you see, we're responsible. Here, Isaiah says, enlarge the, your tents. In the scripture, the, the word tent is the same word that's used as tabernacle. It's a dwelling of God. He's saying, enlarge the capacity of your heart toward the things of God. You see, it's our responsibility every day to enlarge the capacities of our heart toward the things of God. And not allow the, the world to be able to seduce us and pull us away. But realize the eternal things are very important. Our relationship with God is important. And the only way that your heart can be transformed is if you start singing to God. You know, it's amazing because Kathy and I, we've been married 33 years. And, and what happened was we found out that our hearts had been coming hard to each other. And, and, and callous toward each other. And the life of God wasn't flowing through to us in our relationship like it should have been. And thank God we, 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 we know enough in Christ to be able to sit down and say, you know what? We got some challenges. Let's work them out. You know, it, I, I like sometimes when I hear my wife repenting. <laughs> no, I had to do all the repenting. She did all the listening. But it was so good because it took my hard, calloused heart and made it soft again. It took her hard, calloused heart and allowed the life of God to flow out of her heart in our relationship. And that's so important for us. Are you getting this, church? Everybody say, the sounds that I make need to be louder than the sounds that I hear. Sing, O barren one. 
You know, when you come into that season in your relationship with Jesus Christ or in your marriage or in your family where your heart is hard and you're becoming critical, you need to realize you need to start singing. You need a new song in your heart. You need to be able to understand it's our responsibility as individuals to be able to enlarge the, the capacity and propensity of our heart. If not, we're going to limit ourselves. That's why people backslide and, and, and leave their faith. That's why people get, get into divorces. How, how can you be in love with, with, with a person one minute and the next year you've fallen out of love? It's because you don't have the right song in your heart. You don't have the right identity. And you see, each of us are responsible for the way we see ourselves. The way we see ourselves will determine our future and the destiny that God has for us. Now, I know everybody's thinking right now. We're thinking about how we see ourselves in Christ. We're thinking about how we see God. How we see our spouses, how we see our children, how we see our friends. You know, the reason why God wants us to have a song in our heart is because when we sing to God, it develops our identity in Christ. David said this, listen what he says here in Psalms 119, verses 164 and 165. Psalms 119 is the longest chapter in the Bible. He says, seven times of day I praise you. Now, why would David say he praises God seven times a day? He prays God seven times a day for the right identity. The more we praise God, the more we sing to God, the more we make a joyful noise to God, it changes our identity. He says, because of your righteous judgments, great peace have those who love your law. As I sing, I have great peace in my life, and nothing causes your people to stumble. Look at principle number four. Look what it says here in principle number four. When we sing, we neutralize the negative noises that try to distort and oppress our identity in Christ. You see, when, when we sing to God, praises, it neutralizes all the negative thoughts you're thinking about your spouse and yourself, about your children. And it allows your heart, you see, at salvation, our heart becomes flesh. It says that God takes our hard, stony heart and he turns it into flesh. But what happens is, is that the world can conform us. The world can squeeze, they go on the back in the Deborah's kitchen, it's okay. The world can squeeze us into its mold where we start thinking like the world and we start seeing things as the world sees it and we start becoming critical and negative. And boy, before you know it, man, our hearts are all hard and calloused. And we don't have any joy and any life in it. Everybody say sing. So he says, oh, barren one, sing, enlarge the place of your tent. What he's saying is he's saying, you need to be able to take off the limits that are causing you to be critical and hard-hearted. You need to be able to make a determination to step out of that and to step into God, into Christ. You need to be able to understand that it's our responsibility to deal with our own hearts. If your heart's bitter, it's not anyone else's problem except yours. But pastor, you don't know my mother-in-law. You better watch it. You see, the word tent in Scripture represents our heart. In many places, it's the same word used for tabernacle. And what Isaiah is saying here, broaden your heart to the things of God. Don't get tired. Oh, I've done that for 10 years. I've, I, I've done that for 20 years. You know, so, some of us are having a hard time even coming to church. And when that happens, it's because your heart has become calloused and hard to God. The psalmist says, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. You know, there was a man one Sunday morning, his wife was trying to wake him up to go to church. She said, you need to wake up. Come on, it's, it's time. Church is in a half an hour. What you doing sleeping? He said, I don't want to go to church. She said, you need to get up and come right now. No, I don't want to go to church. She, he, she, 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 she said, you got to go to church. You're the pastor. <laughs> he 
You see, that pastor's heart was hard and callous to the things of God. You know that something's wrong in your relationship when you put other things before God. Jesus said, you love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength. And that's just the beginning. We get so hard, we don't want to serve God and we don't want to serve others. We think we work too hard to be able to give our time and serve in others. When that happens, you become critical, church. You become where you become all inward. And you know what happens when a, when a, when a, when a body of water becomes inward? It dries up and dies. So he says, enlarge your heart. Enlarge the capacity of your heart. Step out of that criticism. Step out of that callousness in your relationship with your spouse or your children. And step over into the position where your heart can be enlarged toward them. And how that happens? That happens by your identity. Singing to the Lord and creating a new identity. Look what it says here in principle number five. And individuals, as individuals, it's our responsibility to develop and increase our hearts toward the things that God has for us. Can you hear an amen? amen? Then it goes on, it says, not only enlarge the place of your tent, but it says stretch out the curtains of your dwelling. You see, stretching, when you stretch, you're not holding anything back. Let me tell you, it takes a lot to stretch. And you know what? It's been proven, listen, it's been proven that physical stretching is vital to our body's health. It promotes flexibility and it oxidizes our blood. In fact, stretching is just as important as any other exercise you do. You know, ever since 2010, I got to start renewing my mind to the identity that I, I see myself healthy. I see myself strong. But you know what? I stretch a lot. I stretch a lot. Blessed are the flexible. They don't break. Blessed are the flexible. They don't break. You see, it takes us stretching. Why? Because I don't want to become, you know what? At, at, I want to look like Jim Shesby at, when, when I get older. I don't want to have a cane bent over like this not being able to walk. Come on, somebody. Well, you know, people usually when they have that problem, I'm not belittling them, but it's because of the lack of flexibility. It's, a lack, it's the identity that they see themselves as. They see themselves old. They see themselves weak. They see themselves not strong. You see, it takes you stretching. It takes you being flexible to be transformed. And it's amazing because what we need to understand is, is that Isaiah is saying, look, enlarge your heart toward the things of God. That'll throw the, the critical hardness that's in your heart. It'll deal with it. And then he says, look, not only enlarge it, but let me show you how you enlarge it. You stretch. Everybody say stretch. That means doing something, going a little bit further, working a little bit harder, doing something a little bit longer. Come on. You know, some Christians, they're walking around spiritually, they're like this. Thank God they're not like that in here. My job as a pastor is to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. That went right over your head. Carlos, my job as the pastor is to afflict the comfortable and to comfort the afflicted. And some of us have stopped stretching. You've stopped stretching toward your marriage. You stopped enlarging your heart toward your spouse. And your heart has become calloused. Listen to me. And we need to be able to see in God's presence, he'll put a new song in our heart. A new song to enlarge our, the capacity of our heart toward his things. To start seeing him as he is. To start seeing God's people as they are. To start seeing the church with the right image and the right mindset. Start seeing your spouse in the right way. 
You see, stretching is very important. And all of us need to understand God wants us to stretch as we sing. Look at principle six with me. God wants us to stretch our hearts so that we can contain all that he has for us. Now I want you to think about that. Look at your neighbor and say, there's more. There's more. Dr. Peters, look at your neighbor and say, there's more. There's more. And when we start looking at life like there's not more, we're going to, be start, we're going to start to become callous and hard in our hearts and toward life. It's amazing to see. Then he goes on, he says, stretch out the curtains of your dwelling. Now, I want, I want, I want to talk to you a little bit about that. You see, curtains deal with vision. A curtain can block your vision. You know, you put them on the windows and it blocks the vision. You can't see out of it through the curtain. Close it. But he says, stretch, stretch out the curtains of your dwelling. You see, what he's saying there, he's saying, look, I want you not to hold anything back and I don't want you to limit your vision. I want you to be able to see the things I see. I want you to be able to think the thoughts I think. I want you to see yourself as I see you. Don't let all these curtains of this false identity to limit you in your identity in Christ. I want you to see yourself as I see you. I want your vision to be looking forward. I want you to take your eyes off of where you're at and where you've been, and I want you to put them on where we're going. You see, it takes stretching, you know. It takes stretching, and you know, the older you get, the harder it is to have vision for future. You want to sit back and enjoy life. You want to just kick your feet up. You want to relax. You just want to sit down and take it easy. You know, that's when your heart becomes calloused and hard. When you start wanting to take it easy in your relationship with your wife or with your husband. Oh, she loves me. Baby, I've been good to you. You know, the other night, uh, the other day, last weekend, we went to Deborah Leonard's mother's 82nd birthday party. And they had a, a band there called uh, The Soul Legacy. And boy, they sang some good, good rhythm blues music, good soul music. And uh, I was at the table, and I was looking at my wife, and they had a song come on, and it was... Baby, I've been good to you. And while I was singing that, she was smiling away at me. Oh, baby, I've been good to you. I asked Charles, CJ, CJ, give me a love song. You got a love song from the Commodores, a, a Lionel Richie or somebody? You know, I was going to try to sing something for y'all, but I just couldn't get it. But you see, we need a new song in our heart toward our spouses. Man, I want to challenge you. Valentine's Day is right around the corner. Murray, start singing love songs to your bride. Oh, baby. I got to practice. Love me tender, love me sweet. <laughs> Come on, somebody. What are we doing? We're, we're, we're. We're stretching the propensity of our hearts. We're not being contained by limitations. We realize that life is worth living and not becoming stagnant. Come on, somebody. It's so important to see that. Now, let's go on. Are y'all getting this today? My goodness, I didn't knock my, my notes right off of me. Let me get up here and look. That, that was that song to my wife that got me. Got me all worked up. This is not the one. Who do you think you are? Y'all with me? 
You see what a song will do towards your wife, man, and not your head. It'll get you right out of what you're saying. I got to get my notes here from the news and notes to preach. You see, enlarge your vision. Stretch out those curtains that are limiting you. Start seeing things different. Start seeing them as God sees them. Then he goes on. He says, he says that we need to be able to, to, to strengthen our cords. You know what the cords are? Your thoughts. As you think, so you are. Start renewing your thoughts and start seeing your thoughts as God sees the thoughts. Start speaking life over yourself and not death. Start speaking life over your church and your pastor and not death. Start speaking life over your children and not death. And look, men, I, 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 let me tell you, I don't want to hear you calling your wife an old lady. If I do, you and Pastor Randy are going to tie up. She's your beautiful, precious wife. Look, if a man talks that way about his wife, his heart is hard and calloused. Tomorrow, this morning, Kathy and I decided to ride together to church. Listen, it was something else to see, and I, I, I coined a new name for her. She was getting ready, you know. And I said, I told her, I said, you know what? I'm going to start calling you Pastor Precious. Why is that? Because I'm starting to sing a new song over my marriage. I'm not lacking anymore. My heart's not hard. My heart's not calloused. So we need to be able to strengthen our vision. We need to be able to, to strengthen our thoughts. And last but not least, he says, he says, be able, he says, he talks about the stakes. He talks about the stakes, being able to, to, to strengthen your stakes. You see, your stakes is your core values. It's what you believe. Core values, core biblical values are so important. You see, the flowers fade, the grass withers, but the Word of God lives on forever. And when we, we take and develop our core values according to God's Word, and we strengthen them within us, we have principle to live by. You realize that your, your core value shows you that you're thinking the wrong thoughts. You're seeing yourself the wrong way. And it's so important for us to be able to do that. You know, we talked about our core, the core muscle groups in our body. If our core muscles are weak, everything else is going to be weak. It's the same thing with the stakes of your core values. Now, now let me read this to you. Actually, I'm going to have to quote it because I don't even know what happened to my message, my notes. In the early 60s, President Dwight Eisenhower received a gift, a rare gift. It was a white tiger. So what he did, he, he allowed the Washington Zoo to be able to um, take the tiger in. The tiger's name was Mah Mahai. Let me read it to you. I think I'll do better with it, okay? In the 1960s, President Eisenhower received the rare gift a white tiger named Monahi. For years, Monahi lived in the Washington Zoo. Now listen. And spent her days pacing back and forth in a 12 by 12 foot cage. Finally, the zoo decided to build her a larger cage so Monahi could run, climb, jump, and explore. But when Monahi arrived at her new home, she didn't rush out eagerly adapting to her new habitat. Rather, she marked off a 12 by 12 foot square for herself and paced there until her death, never enjoying the new opportunities in front of her. Monahi's examples exemplifies the classic conditioning most people live within. Although she was a magnificent, powerful creation, Monahi was convinced her place was just a 12 by 12 foot square. You see, we all have the propensity to behave exactly like Monahi. Based on our conditioning, we create invisible cages for ourselves, limiting 
our lives within their boundaries. We all can act the same way if we let ourselves impose cages that limit our identity in Christ. Now, let me ask you a question. Who do you think you are? I'm not asking that in a derogatory way. I'm asking it in a way to make you see yourself as Christ sees you. You know, it's amazing when we talk about our identity and who we are. You know, it's so important to see that as we think, so we are. You know, a person that, that has a hard, calloused heart is going to always be critical. They're going to always be seeing the problem instead of the answer. They're going to always see themselves. They're always in the right, and everybody else is in the wrong. You know, today I want you to be able to look inward because most of the time, people that are stuck in a religious rut and their heart is hard and hardened, what happens is, is they see themselves. You ask them, who do you think you are? They'll say, I'm the righteousness of God in Christ. I'm a new creation. But really, they're just mouthing words. They just know the right thing to say, but they're not feeling it inside. There's no life inside of them. You see, today we all need to look inward and we got to be able to deal with our past and our fears, our friends and our family. And we need to deal with our own hearts. We need to be able to understand that God doesn't want us hard toward him. He doesn't want us hard and callous toward his church. He wants us to be able to be soft-hearted so that the issues of life could be in our relationship with him, with the church with our spouses, with our family. I want you to bow your head with me today.